Hello, Chris Potts here. Welcome to our third screencast on vagueness. The previous screencasts in the unit sought to define and explore the core concepts around vagueness in language with special emphasis on context and context dependence. In this screencast, we're going to essentially apply those ideas in the context of a study of gradable adjectives. The core paper is an experimental one led by Kristen Surrett at Rutgers. The paper is called Meaning and Context in Children's Understanding of Gradable Adjectives. And what I'm going to do here is mainly provide the background necessary to understand the paper. And that way I can leave, for the most part, the study of the paper itself to you. I'm also going to review our in-class experiment, which will further help you to get a feel for what Surrett et al. did and why they did it. The central theoretical idea behind their paper falls under the heading of scale structure. The idea is that adjectives in language conventionally associate with particular scales, and these scales provide the sort of backbone of the meanings of those adjectives. And then, as sort of step two in this argument, we find that scales vary in their structure in ways that shape our intuitions about what the adjectives mean. So the scale structures themselves seem to run deeper than language. They're arguably shaped by the underlying concepts involved. The core scale structures that they explore are depicted here. Uh, in these diagrams, I'm using an open circle at an endpoint to indicate that there isn't actually an endpoint, that the scale continues on forever in that direction. A closed black circle in turn means that the scale ends at that abstract point. So the totally open scales are the ones with two open circles. They're open at both ends. And tall and short are examples of adjectives that associate with such scales. The scale for them is a scale of heights, and these adjectives, as we say, associate with that scale. The lower closed scales are closed at just one end, the lower end. Um, two adjectives that associate with such scales are wet and bent. For wet, the scale is something like a scale of saturation, and the idea here is that having even a little bit of water puts you on that scale, and then you can be arbitrarily saturated, no upper bound. Similarly, for bent, the scale is measuring the angles or something, and to be a little bit bent is to be bent, and then there's no maximal amount of bending. The upper closed scales are sort of the converse. Two examples here are pure and straight. Those are adjectives that associate with this kind of scale. And so the idea here is that, for example, pure is maximal standard, and adding any impurities, even a little bit, moves you lower on that scale, and there's no lower bound on how much impurity you can have. Finally, the totally closed scales are closed at both ends. And the associated adjectives will often appear to have sort of inherent ambiguities. For example, when you say opaque, it can mean a little bit tinted, and then you're sort of using the lower point on the scale. But oddly, opaque can also mean totally impossible to see through. That seems very different, but that's just the upper point on the scale. I think open is the same way. An open door might be slightly ajar or completely wide open. It can be anywhere in between, of course, but the endpoints are likely to be very salient as interpretive points. So those are the core scale structures. Let's start thinking about how all this will interact with vagueness, starting with the adjectives that have totally open scales, like tall and fast. For the totally open cases, we need to set a contextual standard in order to figure out which things the adjective is true of and which things it's false of in that context. And this is a pragmatic challenge because the standard can be set in very different places depending on context, right? Someone who says Kim is tall, well, you need to know what the standard for tallness is to figure out what they're actually claiming about Kim. And this is what we saw before with George the tortoise and Usain Bolt, right? Very different standards for speediness for tortoises and for humans. So bottom line, for the totally open cases, context is absolutely crucial. It's our only hope for setting a standard and then making truth value judgments. Compare that with all the other scale structures. For partially or totally closed scales, we don't need to set a contextual standard because we use the endpoint or the endpoints. For example, if something has some water on it, if it meets the minimal standard for wetness, then it's wet. Or to be even a little bit bent is to be bent. And to be straight requires complete straightness. Any deviation from that is not straight. In a way, what the endpoints are doing is providing us with some non-vague standards that can drive non-context-dependent interpretations. 
And as a result of all this, we immediately see a lot of interesting differences. For example, we reviewed the Sorites paradox in the last screencast, and we can now see that we ran those arguments using adjectives with totally open scales, and this is in fact key to reliably generating the paradox. Consider, for a contrast, this case involving the adjective full. We start with the premise, a theater in which every seat is occupied is full. It seems entirely reasonable. And then we try to move to our recursive step. Any theater with one fewer occupied seat than a full theater is full. However, that seems false even for a single step. So we don't get going with the paradox at all, and we never, of course, reach any paradoxical conclusion. And this is a result of full being upper closed, and so any deviation from the upper point, completely full, flips us right away from true to false. It's pretty striking. Uh, I should say, though, that lingering vagueness might still raise sorority concerns. For example, a full glass of water might still be full with one drop removed. And then we're kind of off and running again with the sorority's paradox. Anyway, at this point, you might be wondering why we're bothering to say that adjectives associated with partially or totally closed scales have scales at all. And the judgment seems to turn on whether something is or isn't full or bent or not or opaque or not with no degrees needed, right? Uh, and there certainly are adjectives that are genuinely like this. For example, one is either married or not, uh, or something is either atomic or not. So those properties don't seem gradable, and you might think that full and bent are actually in that class. However, even adjectives with totally closed scales will behave differently. For example, they can be modified by very. Something can be very full or very closed or very straight. And these adjectives can appear in comparatives, which explicitly measure things along the scale without committing to any of them being at the endpoint, right? You can say things like, this rod is more bent than that rod, or A is wetter than B. By contrast, you can't easily say things like, very married, or very atomic, or A is more married than B. Well, I should say, you can say those things, of course, but it involves coercing the concept into a gradable one, and that might be somewhat indeterminate, right? The listener might not be clear about what exactly to do in a case where you've said something like very atomic. Whereas for things like very wet or very full, well, we don't require any coercion at all, and there's very little uncertainty. Great. I have one more piece of background to fill in, and this relates to modification by adverbs. And the idea here is that we can use specific adverbs to diagnose the scale structure underlying an adjective. I think these things are pretty conceptually natural, though there may be some linguistic uncertainty in the mix too, and we should address that. But anyway, we focus on three classes of adverbs. Maximality adverbs are like completely, fully, totally, absolutely, 100%, and perfectly. Proportion adverbs are things like half, mostly, most of the way, two-thirds, three-sevenths, and so forth. And finally, the minimality adverbs are things like slightly, somewhat, and partially. When we try to modify various adjectives with these adverbs, we see a clear and intuitive grammaticality pattern. And this table summarizes the pattern. So here an asterisk, as usual, means the adverb-adjective combination is ungrammatical or at least very unusual. And a check mark means that the combination is grammatical and probably fairly routine. So the claim is that the impossible combinations are ruled out because of pretty deep conceptual mismatches. For example, proportion adverbs require upper and lower ends. How else would you know that you were at, say, the two-thirds point? If you're open at one end, then there's just no notion of two-thirds. So you can say things like two-thirds open because that's closed at both ends, but not two-thirds tall or two-thirds wet. By the same light, we can see that maximality adverbs are targeting the upper points. They deeply presuppose that there is such a point. So you can say things like 100% straight, but you can't say things like 100% bent, because there's no notion of what it means to be 100% bent. And the minimality adverbs do the same thing for the lower points. So you can get slightly bent, but not slightly straight. These are really noteworthy patterns, and I do think they're pretty robust, but it's worth reflecting a bit on this in the context of trying to understand these judgments better. So, here's my take on this. First, linguists usually describe their predictions like this. Completely tall and two-thirds tall will just be ungrammatical. 
No one will use them intentionally because the meaning of tall doesn't have the right kind of scale structure, and so we won't really encounter these phrases out in the wide world. Okay, but the issue here is that with a large enough corpus of examples, you will see people using these phrases. So what do we make of that? I personally like the following more pragmatic perspective. If a speaker says completely tall or two thirds tall, they're clearly presupposing uh, and they'll be construed as presupposing that tall has the right kind of scale structure in the current context. And that might prompt some questions from the listener since it's surprising and maybe it's hard even to know what it would mean. But perhaps we can find contexts where it's so natural as to be hardly even noticeable. That would just require us to have lower and upper standards for height, I suppose. Anyway, my view is clearly different from what the linguists usually say, right? The usual linguists is predicting that we'll never encounter these phrases and that we'll call them meaningless if we're presented with them in the lab. Whereas my view is silent on whether they'll actually occur and it predicts something about their interpretation if they do occur, or at least interactions that people will have around their occurrences. And since you can easily find these adjective adverb combinations on the web, I'd advise you to side with me. All right, great. I'm confident that you now have everything you need to understand the motivations and background ideas for the Surrett et al. experiments. And with these, th these things in place, the paper is quite accessible, at least in the section that you need to read. And so I'm not going to review all the details here. What I've done instead is pose some questions that get at the important information. If you can answer these questions, you're in great shape in terms of understanding the paper. Maybe the most vital item is the first one, which isn't a question, but rather a goal. Just make sure that you understand the design well enough to actually try out one of the crucial conditions on a friend, say. Since we did a version of the experiment together, you're probably already all set here, but you might pay special attention to the protocols that Surrett et al. used for children, because they're somewhat different from our adult design. Second question, what assumptions do the authors make about the felicity conditions of the definite determiner? The assumptions seem totally in line to me with the view we've taken on definite descriptions in the context of our theory of presuppositions and presupposition accommodation, but still make sure you can articulate an answer here because it's crucial to understanding the logic of the experiment. Next, what role do the control examples in table one play in the experiment? That's a good experimental detail to track. And then we get to brass tacks. On the theory summarized above, what is the expected pattern of behavior for children and adults for the following prompts in a situation in which there are two medium-sized cups spotted, both with some liquid in them, but neither full, where one is noticeably larger than the other? So we have hand me the cup, hand me the tall cup, hand me the full cup, hand me the spotted cup. Make sure you know what the predictions are for each one of those cases. And finally, I'm about to provide a partial answer to this final question here. How well do the results of our in-class experiment align with those of Surrett et al. for totally open adjectives, lower closed adjectives, and upper closed adjectives? So let's turn to that question to round out this discussion. Recall that we did this experiment in class with most people on Zoom, and the instructions read, the display will show two potential reference labeled A and B, and a request at the bottom of the page that I'll read aloud. Your job is to fulfill my request by identifying my intended referent or else determine that my request cannot be fulfilled. So I showed pictures and read requests and people made their choices in a Google form. So to start our review here, I had just two fillers as kind of warm ups and also checks that the experiment was working as I expected. And the picture here looks good for hand me the red one and this in the display with one red and one black cup. Everyone chose the red one. That's reassuring. The next filler is perhaps more important. Here the request is again, hand me the red one. And people did go for request unfulfillable. It's important that people are willing to do that for the experiment to work. So this is again quite reassuring. Next, the experiment had one clearly open scale adjective, which was big. For hand me the big one, we got the expected results for one really big cup next to a smaller one. And we also got the expected result when we changed the context so that the previously non-big cup was now the big one in that new context. 
So this is great in terms of supporting the context-dependent standard-setting approach for these totally open adjectives. Next, we turn to striped. My expectation was that striped would be lower closed. Even a few stripes make something striped, and you can say things like slightly striped and somewhat striped. Okay, but the responses don't really align with that. In a display with two striped cups, the response request unfulfillable was chosen by only about half of participants. The other half did something that is at least consistent with them interpreting striped as maybe more striped, which is a construal that Surrett et al. are actually at pains to argue doesn't arise. So this is intriguing. For what it's worth, when I did this in 2019, I did see the expected pattern. With the same display, almost everyone went for unfulfillable. I don't have an explanation for this variation, though. Our next crucial item is the maximal standard case. Here I use straight. My control item worked great. In a display with one very straight rod and one not straight one, everyone responded to hand me the straight one by choosing the straight rod. So good. But then comes my crucial item. In a display with two bent rods, the prediction is that people will determine that hand me the straight one is unfulfillable. But about two thirds of people chose what looks like the straighter rod and only one third in turn conformed to the expectations of the Surrett et al. theory. I'm not sure what the story is here. In 2020, the results conformed a bit better, but it's still not a slam dunk. To get the expected result, it seems like you have to make the two rods both very bent, as in 2019. And if one of the rods is nearly straight, you get the pattern we saw this year, with a split between choosing the straight one and determining that the request can't be fulfilled. So I have to say, while I've run this plenty of times where it did work out in Surrett et al.'s favor, I also think there's more variation in these experiments than we expected, and this might suggest that we need to fundamentally rethink the theory here. To round this out, my experiment did include two items that were meant to engage with a new angle on the data. These final two items were the last in the experiment, they're items 9 and 10. Both used the utterance, hand me the empty one, uh, and empty is a maximal adjective. For the first display, one wine glass is clean and empty, and the other has a residue of wine at the bottom, but nothing more. And here, almost everyone chose the completely clean glass. I was wondering, though, whether both glasses might be pragmatically empty, that is, offering nothing to sip, and that that might lead to a response of request unfulfillable. And then in item 10, the wine glass with the residue was paired with a quite full glass of wine. And here people chose the one with the residue as the empty one. So the noteworthy thing here is that this glass wasn't empty, so to speak, in item 9. And so why is it empty here? Right? This is, again, behavior that's consistent with a more empty construal, which is arguably a challenge to Surrett et al.'s overall conclusions. But I still think there may be a role for, for goal orientation and contextual reasoning here that might help them out, but I don't have a conclusive conclusion at present. I guess that's vagueness for you.